that last remark remarks a bit optimistic because uh, the, the original title of the reality at risk was supposed to be in defense of realism and the publishers thought that was too boring a title but I wanted to defend realism and ever since I wrote that book it seems to me realism has in fact retreated more and more and we've had postmodernism and relativism in fact I've been writing against relativism for 40 years and the more I've written against it the more popular it's become <laughs> uh, uh, relativism seems to be in the very air we breathe nowadays but um, that doesn't mean I'm not still against it. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here. I mean, not least because uh, I knew Professor Artigas. We used to meet uh, regularly at conferences of the European Society for Science and Theology in various points across Europe. And uh, it's, it's very nice to be able to come and talk about his work. I'm a philosopher, so to pick up on one or two of the things we were talking about in the last session, I'm afraid I do think to quote another title of one of my books, Philosophy Matters, and uh, I have a vested interest in this, obviously, uh, but I think philosophy is important. I think it's actually the ground on which uh, religion and science meet. Uh, I don't think it's an optional extra, and there are plenty of scientists who think they don't need philosophy, but that doesn't mean they're not implicitly believing a lot of it. Uh, it's just that it's not explicit. And uh, sometimes an examined life is better than an unexamined life. So this is what I hope to be doing this afternoon, bringing out perhaps some things that are implicit in science or that ought to be, uh, in fact, it both implicit and explicit. And this really deals with the issue of reality. I hope, by the way, you all have a sheet so, giving a kind of running order of, of what I'm talking about so that once you doze off in the middle of the afternoon, you can wake up and, and see, in fact, where we've got to. I, I'll keep more or less to, to where we are. Um, I have a paper that I'll talk to, but won't read all of it. But what is reality, even physical reality? Uh, in uh, the last session, uh, when we were talking about eschatology, uh, the issue of reality came up because uh, there is a tendency, and I think even in theology, to think of reality in exclusively physical terms, because we're physical beings, we're in the here and now, and that's what we're used to. Uh, but I think that it is a mistake to think that, um, though this is the subject of another lecture, I, I think that uh, although it's uh, very fashionable to attack forms of dualism, uh, Christian theology is irredeemably dualistic because God and the world are two objects, not one unless we're pantheists, and God is not physical. Um, so uh, one must bear that in mind. And because of that, because reality isn't physical, I think that, or not wholly to be defined in terms of the physical, there is a question about our knowledge of it and how far our knowledge extends. There is a temptation to define reality in terms of epistemology. Um, I think the logical positivists, of whom more later empiricists, tended to do that. What we can experience, what we can know, is what there is. But that's defining reality in terms of us. And as I want to <coughs> emphasize, that's the wrong way around. Reality isn't just the shadow cast by our knowledge. It's the target of our knowledge. It isn't just a human projection. And this kind of presupposition is built into the very fabric of science, and the practice of science depends on it, as Mariano Artigas argues in his book, The Mind of the Universe. This use of the word presupposition doesn't directly refer to the beliefs of scientists. It refers to objective states of affairs implicitly included in the practice of science. And so we need, whether we realize it or not, philosophical presuppositions, perhaps more explicitly even metaphysical presuppositions, in order to validate the practice of science. I mean, why is it that science, in fact, is possible? How is it that it can be justified? Artigas himself, um, although I, I broadly agree with the thrust of his remarks, I don't think he makes this distinction between philosophy and science quite so clearly after discussing my own views about the preconditions of science, as I argued for them in my Rationality and Science, Artigas says, these conditions can be considered a part of science as necessary conditions for it. Um, well, 
uh, I'll come back to that again, but uh, I, I do think that we need a philosophical justification as well as uh, some kind of empirical verification. And Artigas, I think, was thinking that you, to use a word of, a word of his, can <coughs> retro-justify science. I'm not so sure about that. Anyway, looking at the nature of reality, uh, what I want to emphasize is that its reality, its, in, its nature, is independent of us. Uh, in social reality, uh, the reality of society, human beings are causally involved in producing it. I mean, banks are human products, but as recent events have shown, that doesn't necessarily mean that we understand, anybody understands, everything that's going on. Uh, reality can outstrip our understanding. It isn't a construction out of it. Uh, so if that's true of social reality, which is causally produced by us, but isn't necessarily logically dependent on our understanding, I think it's certainly true of physical reality. And, and it, this afternoon I want to be talking about uh, physical reality, not so much the social sciences. Does science then tell us anything about reality and how can we be sure that it does? Does it just reflect the workings of the human mind on a, to a broader canvas? So that what we see isn't an independent world at all, but the world is constructed by our concepts and by human understanding. I mean, there's a whole industry called social constructivism that wants to say things like that. This whole view, of course, is also verging towards idealism, saying that reality is mind-centered, in particular, I suppose, centered on the human mind. Well, many have tried to say that science is just science produced by humans, its categories are human. We're not, when we do science, carving reality at the joints, we're just projecting our own conceptual scheme. It's like just looking down in a deep, deep well and glimmeringly seeing somebody looking up at you and you don't realise it's actually you, it's your reflection. Well, is science like that, you just build a wonderful edifice, but one that reflects the tastes, predilections, interests of the builder. Uh, is science just an expression of the human personality, a bit like painting? Well, perhaps you might say this is all fanciful. I mean, no working scientist thinks that. Who seriously says that science doesn't produce knowledge? Who seriously says it isn't about a real world? Well, as I said in the introduction, I think that unfortunately that's just what many people do say, even many philosophers nowadays. Relativism, the idea that there is no truth, dare I say it, the idea that it is true that there's no truth, um, <laughs> it, 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 no reality, uh, only what traditions and <coughs> beliefs, ways of life happen to believe, uh, that is what many people just take for granted. Even reflection on the history of science makes a lot of people think, well, it's all just social construction because we didn't believe a hundred years ago, just over a hundred years ago, what we do now uh, about physics, for instance. Uh, who knows what will be believed, what will be believed in a hundred years' time? And I mean that does raise an issue. Um, it was Quine, for instance, who said that um, uh, one day he thought scientists would be able to explain ghosts. I was thought that was an interesting remark because, I mean, a lot of tough-minded scientists would say there aren't any such things as ghosts and I'm not going to believe any evidence about it because they're not what science can cope with. <coughs> it's a kind of tough-minded naturalist approach. Uh, Quine, I think, was perhaps more willing to accept that there could be evidence for things we can't at present conceive of, but they would be subsumed in a naturalistic framework, naturalism from a metaphysical point of view. But it does suggest that science as it one day it will be isn't the same as science <coughs> as we now can conceive it as being. In that case you get a, an absolute paradigm shift to quote Kuhn. Um, we would be living in a different world perhaps. Well postmodernism involves the reaction against modernist ways of thinking dating from the Enlightenment. Different traditions, societies embed their reasons in different contexts so the idea of universal reason is ruled out. And of course that's bad news for science because science is above all uh, the, the product of the Enlightenment. Uh, 
which enlightenment, which part of which enlightenment, is something that I think is worth thinking about. But we often see it as influenced by the later enlightenment, particularly as seen in France, where it got very materialist. But it's easy to see this whole uh, episode in the growth of knowledge as being just one intellectual tradition to be replaced by another, the exemplification of the growth of knowledge and progress seen in enlightenment is just one movement amongst others. It shows Western science, one tradition, no tradition is uh, better than any others. There's no view from nowhere, no absolute conception. We can't get outside every conceptual scheme. So you can't, in fact, get outside everywhere to say what's really true. So all we can do is what we say now. And why do we say it? Because that's what we say now. For this reason, um, reference, I think, actually to language games and the inability to justify them in the later Wittgenstein um, was unhelpful because I do feel the issue of justification is important. Why do we play the game we do? I, I mean, I came past Lords this morning. Everybody was in hope streaming to the test match. And, uh, well, the question is, why play cricket? What's the point of cricket? I actually think there's a tremendous point. Um, I, in many ways, I was envious. I would have liked to have gone to the test match today. Uh, but, except that the, the, the prospects of play when I was passing didn't look too bright, but still, it's better now. Perhaps England have won. Uh, but, uh, uh, but, but I, I mean, it seems inappropriate to say, why cricket? Is cricket true? Or what, is it better than baseball? Or anything like that, because it's not the kind of thing you ask about a game. But is it the kind of thing you can ask about science? You know, some people play cricket, others baseball. Some people do science, others go swimming. I mean, it doesn't seem right. There's, science is about something more important. It isn't just a game. And I know the game is just an analogy, but Wittgenstein tended to think of justification in terms of forms of life. He ruled out him anywhere metaphysical to stand to judge forms of life. And that means that science cannot be justified. There's nowhere to stand. You take it or leave it. And, uh, I mean, Wittgenstein couldn't justify <coughs> physics. And I think he got worried about that in uncertainty. Uh, but, I mean, you are in quite a serious position if you can't say why you should trust physics rather than oracles or something like that. But science actually seems to be more serious than that. Science is claiming universal truth. What we discover in London is going to be, it is supposed, valid in Beijing or Washington, D.C. And the universality is not accidental. It doesn't depend on characteristics of observers or the nature of their society. Reality isn't a social thing. So this independence of reality from science and the context in which it's conducted doesn't just show that science and any form of relativism have to be mortal enemies. It carries with it wider implications. Relativism provides a strong challenge to the possibility of metaphysics and in the process undermines science. Sometimes those who wish to uphold religion in the face of perceived onslaughts from science actually welcome forms of postmodernism. I've come across lots of theologians who think, oh, good, science can't claim truth. They can't tell us we're wrong. But that's a very dangerous argument because, all right, science can't say religion is wrong, but religion can no longer say it's right because there's no longer any truth. So religion, people within religion are nicely fenced round. They defend themselves from criticism, but it's at the expense of any claim to truth. Um, I regard that as extremely dangerous. And once metaphysics, with its ontological targets, and ontological underpinning uh, uh, dis is discarded, science and religion are pointless. They're about nothing beyond themselves. They may reflect human nature, um, and if I might just in parenthesis say that that isn't itself a trivial point. Um, in fact, uh, the research that I, I'm involved with in Oxford on an interdisciplinary basis is 
tending to show, rather controversially, that religion is very deeply rooted in human nature, more so actually than science. I mean, science would be regarded much more as a kind of second-order discipline like theology, reflections on, but religious impulses <coughs> are deeply rooted in what it is to be human. You couldn't subtract religion without subtracting our humanity, and there's plenty of research um, anthropo anthropological about the universality of religion and psychological about child development showing that, um, to put it briefly, uh, religion is the <coughs> default option. We start uh, naturally by being religious. Atheism is a much more sophisticated thing. Now, that doesn't prove one or the other is right or wrong, but it does show that religion is there and has to be accounted for, and I think that that, that itself is important. Uh, it's not good enough for scientists to ignore religion because science itself shows its importance and centrality. Well, any idea of rational justification, whether of science or religious belief, is unintelligible without some kind of metaphysical base. We can aim at a coherence of belief, but there are any number of coherent belief systems. Without the idea of reality as it is in itself, any belief is as good as any other. Uh, there's really no point if you're faced with a lot of beliefs in, in plumping for one or the other if you don't think that one is true. Um, an analogy I, I sometimes uh, find myself dwelling on is my, my experience in a multi-storey car park when there's nobody else there and you drive up and you're faced with a myriad of spaces and you think, well, where should I go? <laughs> now, uh, perhaps um, uh, the rational thing is to go to the one nearest the exit, but uh, if you can't quite see the exit, any space is as good as any other. And if you're not very careful, uh, one can get paralysed and stop the car and think, well, what should I do? Uh, it's a bit like that with beliefs. I mean, why? What's the point if, if it doesn't matter? Uh, it isn't just that you plump for one, you don't know which one to plump for. There's no, no point at all. Like Buridan's ass paralysed between bales of hay. So a removal of metaphysics can be the death of religion. And Nietzsche certainly saw clearly that it was the death of God. Um, I, I think there's a lot in Nietzsche. I, I detest everything about him. But uh, nevertheless, uh, he does draw out the consequences of removing God and metaphysics. And I'm inclined to say that if you do that, you are left with a lot of what Nietzsche says. I would argue that um, subtracting reality uh, from, uh, the, uh, in an objective sense, in a metaphysical sense, from science, uh, in fact, is the death of science. Now, most scientists take it for granted they're investigating a real world. We heard that this morning. Um, yes, of course they do. And they don't want to be told that that actually involves a bit of philosophy. But uh, it, they might think it's just common sense. But common sense is very often built on the philosophy of previous generations. So uh, the philosophy is there, certainly. <coughs> but scientists are just assuming the truth of realism. Uh, and sometimes when realism is under attack, perhaps a mere assumption has to be defended. Now, one way many scientists and philosophers try and combine realist intuitions whilst eschewing metaphysics, is by making human science itself the arbiter of truth. Um, that's sometimes called scientism. Again, it's in the very air we breathe. And in a sense, it's the continuation of the Enlightenment project, the later Enlightenment, trusting in the power of human reason <coughs> and that alone. And it's assumed that this somehow puts us in touch with reality. And uh, the view, view that empirical science constitutes knowledge certainly avoids difficult issues about ontology. And as I've said, um, the 18th century became progressively more materialistic, particularly in France. But the modern Enlightenment, uh, and the 18th century version of it particularly, had its roots in the 17th century, and I think all too often when people talk about the Enlightenment, they think of Kant or they think of France. Uh, but I would argue that uh, if you want to look at the Enlightenment and its trust in human reason and the role of science as the expression of that reason, uh, you actually need to look at England in the mid-17th century. 
and what's going on there. And there you begin, I mean, of course, there's no sharp break, and I'm sure that it's a continuation of things that were going on before as well. But insofar as modern science is starting then, you can see the theological and philosophical underpinnings in it of it very clearly, and they involve a trust in reason. Now, why was there that trust in reason? It wasn't arbitrary. But why should human reason be trusted? How can we, we be sure that we can obtain knowledge of the world? Why is the world such that it could be understood? I mean, this is linked to issues, again, that have come up about, for instance, how mathematics can be understood to connect with reality. And as I said, the great temptation in our century is to take the success for granted. But if we go back to the 17th century, it's apparent that science didn't become possible just because the early scientists believed there was a reality to be investigated, as they did. They believed it was of a particular character, and the character was that it had been created by a rational mind with a particular rationale. Only for that reason did they have any confidence that the physical world was both orderly and predictable. It reflected the mind of the creator. Coming to understand it, was a general form of revelation of the will of God. And as many of you know, the idea of two books, the book of nature as well as the book of the Bible, uh, which both could be read, um, uh, it became current. The author's intentions could be seen in both. From the perspective of science, it was no use having an orderly universe, obeying by what were then thought to be fixed laws given by a law giver if nobody could understand it. So it isn't just there is a reality, but how are we in touch with it? I mean, in other words, almost what's the connection between ontology and epistemology? Reality may be orderly, but it also had to be intelligible and comprehensible. These are indispensable presuppositions, to use the term Artigas favoured, and as he put it, such presuppositions are both ontological and epistemological, and he stressed the relevance of the ethical too, but I'm just looking at the first two. The ontological presupposition refers to the rationality of nature. The epistemological refers to the human ability to know the natural order. Now, these presuppositions were explicitly in the minds of the founders of modern science. Scientists such as Newton and many of the founders of the Royal Society had been influenced by the thought of the Cambridge Platonists. I don't know if how many of you uh, are interested or aware of the work of the Cambridge Platonists. They were a group of philosophers and theologians during and just after the Civil War in England, based for the most part in Cambridge. People like Moore and Witchcott and Sterry, there was a whole group of them. But they formed a distinct group and Perhaps they are known more for their influence than just for their own writings. Uh, certainly they influenced people like Newton, um, who uh, uh, certainly they were in at the beginning of the Royal Society. Some of them were members of the Royal Society. Certainly they influenced the thought of uh, people like John Locke. Um, John Locke actually nearly married the daughter of one of them, so he was particularly involved there. And, uh, uh, but, um, I mean, a lot of their thought and their, their notions of reason and the importance of science and so on feeds then through into philosophy in a wider way through the empiricism of Locke. Now, the great slogan of the Cambridge uh, Platonists, um, you can see it in the stained glass of Emmanuel College Chapel in Cambridge, where one of them is commemorated, though some of them were associated with that college, um, is reason is the candle of the Lord. Reason is the candle of the Lord. I think it's a, a rather nice slogan. Um, it was, I think, used by them almost ad nauseam. I think people got rather fed up with it, but it echoes through the 17th and 18th centuries. Locke uses it as a phrase. Even John Wesley uses it. So it, it is a phrase that, that had a, a ready resonance. And of course, the idea is that human reason is given us because of the rationality of the creator. We reflect God's rationality, and therefore it's not un uh, at all surprising if we can understand the inherent rational structure of the world as created by God. In a sense, the logos within us can be in touch with the logos as shown 
in the world. Uh, but of course, the, no the notion of a candle is important. I mean, it isn't just a nice imagery. Um, I mean, it does show that our understanding is pale and flickering. I mean, you just think back to the 17th century where without electric light, I mean, candlelight was not glaring. It wasn't uh, something that would illuminate things absolutely. It would cast shadows. But it would dispel some of the darkness. It would provide some illumination. And that came not just through human reason standing on its own, which was the later Enlightenment version, it came through human reason understood as dependent on divine reason. And that, I think, is a significant conclusion. If our minds as humans were created by the Creator, if we were created in His image, our ability to understand the creation is itself less strange. Now, Artegas himself doesn't see the necessary presuppositions of science as, as perhaps continuing to exist independently of science. He sees the intrinsic rationality of the physical world, coupled with our ability to know and understand it, as itself confirmed by empirical science. And he writes that scientific progress provides feedback on these presuppositions because it retro-justifies, to use that word, enriches and refines them. So there is a kind of empirical confirmation going on of something that science starts off assuming. <coughs> and he says, scientific progress is sufficient evidence of their scope. The success of the scientific enterprise, he says, provides us with new knowledge about the rationality of nature. And an example he himself gives is uh, that, that our growing understanding about order being turned into self-organisation. Now, all that raises in a fascinating way the precise connection between the presuppositions that I think are necessary for the practice of science and the very possibility that science itself can confirm or presumably disconfirm them. I'm not quite sure what it would be, though, to disconfirm them. I mean, science just collapses, I suppose. There's undoubtedly truth in the assertion that the growth in scientific knowledge enriches our understanding of the rationality of the world, and the success of quantum mechanics, for instance, has changed our view of physical reality. We no longer see it as completely deterministic. But in the end, um, is our understanding of the intelligibility and rationality of the world, its intrinsic order, is that itself proved by <coughs> science? What would it be for us as humans to discover scientifically we can't understand the physical world? Does that show itself it's disordered, not ordered? Is it realism itself an empirical thesis? Well, I doubt all that because, in the end, I don't think that we can validate the claim that the world is intrinsically intelligible through science because the issue will always be, are we labouring under the seductive illusion that we can understand when we can't, or that we seem to understand when we don't really, or that we understand a bit of reality that actually is highly untypical, that we actually li live in an isolated island of apparent order, within a sea of disorder. And remember, the whole point of science is that it extrapolates from here to there, now to then, um, from here to the other side of the universe, to, to parts of reality that we can, in principle, never reach. How can we do that? How could science ever confirm that? Now, uh, we're up all the time, again, and some of you here may, I think, share this view against the view that, well, philosophers are all very well, but they just make simple things appear difficult and let's really, uh, I mean, it would, life would be a lot simpler without them and uh, they don't really earn their keep. Um, the story is told by William James of how he was on a trip in upstate New York camping and his companions had an argument as to what was happening. Now, uh, they saw a squirrel. I don't know if you <coughs> look at squirrels very much. There's so many of them around you, you can see they, what they do. Um, if, if you see a squirrel going up a tree trunk and you think, well, I'll, I'll just go round to see him better, the squirrel will normally go round the tree trunk to keep the trunk away from you. Um, and so, so as you go round, the squirrel goes round. I mean, they're quite good at this. Now, James's companions were having an argument as to whether as they were going round the tree and the squirrel was going round the tree, were they going round the squirrel? 
Um, and James got absolutely fed up with this because he said, look, this is a typical metaphysical argument. It doesn't make any difference to life at all. What difference does it make? One answer is as good as any other. The facts are still the same. Um, you can describe them differently, but so what? It's a typical metaphysical issue, intrinsically vacuous. <laughs> um, and, of course, that's the root of, of a pragmatist view, because William James, like Peirce, uh, was a pragmatist philosopher who really thinks that the kind of spin-off of reality is what you can do with it, how you behave. What difference does it make? If it doesn't make a difference, there isn't any real aspects there. And, uh, I mean, I, I find that very unsatisfying. There's no escaping from the fact, that actually, that the realist approach to science is metaphysical, which precedes all practice. But there's no, I think there's also no escaping the fact that, in the end, uh, without that realist approach, uh, science itself is in a bad way. If there's no reality, there's no truth. Only what we, whoever we may be, happen to believe is true. We can't be wrong. We can't be right. And indeed, all the words I think uh, I, I utter ultimately meaningless because there's no reality out there to which we all have access. Um, if I could just for a moment just emphasize that point, that one of the great features of reality is that it's the same for everybody. It's objective, meaning we all have access to it. That means it isn't parceled up between different types of belief, different groups of believers, now, this is, in a sense, just to say that my idea of reality is not relativist, but it does have great consequences because it means if you're in one society, you can hope to understand what's happening in another society because you all have access to the same reality. You can all say, well, look, and uh, that's how language, I think, gets taught in the first place. If you can't assume a child sees what you see, there's little hope in teaching words. I mean, that's why you can't teach colour words to somebody who's colourblind. Uh, you, we need, um, in that case, not just the idea of a similar reality, but a similar apprehension of it, too, which is, a, I mean, the idea of a similar human nature, I think, enters in here, too. Uh, I think that the notion of, of reality, as well, is important in that reality, I think, because it's independent, isn't just reality as conveyed by science, there are going to be other bodies of belief, not least uh, religion, which may also want to talk about reality. And if it's the same reality, if they are coming at it from different points of view, nevertheless, there's the possibility of conflict or agreement, of mutual support or a mutual lack of support. But they all will have something to do with each other. In other words, if you take a realist view seriously, Reality is not compartmentalized, and that means that religion and science are not going to be, uh, to use one phrase that's been current sometimes, non-overlapping magisteria. In other words, they're not just um, different bodies of belief that don't overlap. Uh, that's actually a very popular view among many quarters, not least among scientists who secretly think that science tells them the truth, but they don't want to be rude to people who are religious, so they say, well, we're just talking about different things, and unsaid is the thought, if we're, we're talking about what's true, you're not talking about anything. Um, and so uh, I think it's terribly important to realise that the notion of reality is common to everybody. And it can trip us all up or we can agree about it. But the impatience of many people with metaphysical speculation is hard to shake off. Science, it's felt, delivers the goods. Reality is what science tells us it is. It may seem as if this is crude positivism, and it's not far from A.J. Ayer's verification principle. Uh, I make no apology to going back, now this is going back 40, 50 years, or even more, um, to Ayer, because I think, again, that still influences a lot of the way many people think about things. Um, Ayer defined truth and meaning in terms of the ability to verify, to falsify scientifically. Uh, I think he... he uh, found it difficult to justify the verification principle. Um, once uh, he taught me in Oxford, and once when I asked him about it, he said, oh, well, it's an axiom, which is all very well, as I, we will see. And lest it seem as if this kind of dispute is receding into history, and it can't, I'm 
just very briefly, I'd say it can't account for modern physics, uh, let alone uh, anything else. But uh, lest it seem that this kind of dispute is receding into history, uh, the influence of logical positivism, positivism lives on. It's certainly alive and work, uh, alive and well in the work of writers like Richard Dawkins. Now, I suppose that's not a coincidence because Richard Dawkins would have been a young man, a teenager in the heyday of logical positivism, he would have been influenced by it insofar as he's ever thought about any philosophy, which isn't very much. Um, he would uh, actually uh, have been imbued with the principles of verification and falsification. To him, that's what philosophy is, because he hasn't looked at very much since about 1960. Now, um, if you look at, at uh, the God delusion, I mean, I'm, I'm not just being unkind. I mean, it, it actually explicitly is what he's saying, really. Um, he, he stresses the importance of evidence and reason, so would we all, but then he surreptitiously defines these words in time terms of the capabilities of contemporary science. And let me just say, of course, that that's itself an interesting point, because when you want to define reality in terms of science, when you want to put forward, say, a physicalist, a naturalist point of view, uh, if it's contemporary science, you're not giving yourself any elbow room for science developing. If, on the other hand, you want to say, well, it isn't science as it nowadays, now is, it's, to quote somebody this morning, science as it will be in 500 years' time, um, or indeed science as it could in principle be, then we've got a problem there because science is in, in principle could be is getting to look almost as metaphysical as the reality that I want to uphold <coughs> because it may not be the science anybody actually ever does hold. And uh, I think therefore, uh, and unless you know what you mean by science and unless it has some relation to what we now think and who, why should what, what we now think be the final word on it, um, I think you've got to accept that science is measured against something beyond itself. Anyway, to go back to Daw Dawkins, for him, evidence is what is publicly available, what can be publicly checked. It's um, uh, something that, in fact, is the province of science. Reason is seen in terms of the empirical methods of science. Now, Dawkins contrasts books about evolution with the faith of fundamentalists in a holy book. He says, for instance, the truth of the holy book is an axiom. And it's interesting he used that, as that word. Not the end product of a process of reasoning. In contrast, he says, with reference to his belief in evolution, I have studied the evidence. In principle, any reader can go and check that evidence. Anything, it seems, which isn't publicly checkable isn't to be regarded as rational or as evidence. It's irrational faith. And so, by a slate of hand, any belief in God appears irrational. It's not based on evidence. I mean, this is just pure logical positivism. And faith, then, can never be allied with reason, because reason is already wholly in the service of science. All religious faith, then, is tarred, as Dawkins tars it, with the brush of an irrational and dogmatic fundamentalism. It's intriguing that Dawkins accuses his religious opponents of operating with axioms, not evidence. And that was what Eyre proudly said his view was. For Dawkins, obviously, axiom isn't, an axiom isn't something to be proud of. <coughs> Yet, Dawkins' equation of scientific method and rationality is itself in need of philosophical justification. And the linking of our beliefs about what's real with what's scientifically accessible has gone through a lot of names, materialism, physicalism, naturalism, as we were talking about this morning. Uh, but nevertheless, it's quite clear that we are faced with a choice, that we either make reality the shadow cast by human understanding, we make reality anthropocentric, we think we know everything, and what we don't know isn't worth knowing. Um, it was... Uh, I think Donald Rumsfeld, who, who talked about the unknown unknowns, and people were uh, very scorn, scornful of that. Uh, I thought, actually, it was actually a surprisingly profound statement because uh, there are a lot of things, not only that we don't know, but we don't know we don't know them. And perhaps one day, I mean, the path to knowledge is suddenly realising we don't know them. And then one day we might know more. Artigas argues against the naturalist claim that there exists nothing but 
what can be studied by means of empirical science. And he points out this naturalist, nothing but is closed, enclosed. He believes that a fully developed naturalism should include all the dimensions of the natural world, including the metaphysical dimensions. Well, I'm with him in spirit on that, but I think probably he's hoping to um, extend the term naturalism beyond where it really can be extended by saying that all those against metaphysics who are talking about naturalism actually just need to bring metaphysics in. But certainly, while any understanding of physical reality has to take it seriously in its own terms, it must also be seen as something that's part of a wider canvas. We have to have a, a wider metaphysical version, vision. Even naturalism itself, let me emphasize, is a metaphysical vision. It's a philosophical belief, and its arguments against metaphysics only make sense as statements about the status of science made from outside science. Once outside, the only ground on which to stand is metaphysical. And that's the ground on which both science and religion have to stand in their assertions about the character of reality beyond human belief. And then I do believe they can contribute to each other's understanding. If there's one reality, all statements about it must ultimately converge. Uh, and if I can just say very briefly, because this is a further interest of mine, that uh, when we emphasize the importance of reality, as being something independent and open to everybody. And once we realize it isn't necessarily confined to science, indeed to defend science, we have to stand outside science itself, then I, I think we realize that religion is making claims about a reality that's open to everybody, whether religion is true or not. It, they're claims that ought to be taken seriously and rationally discussed. Therefore, religion is not something that can be pushed off into a private corner, as so many people in modern society believe. So this whole debate about realism does impinge on wider issues in public life about the place of religion. Religion is not irrational, subjective, private. It's making claims about something that's public and objective. Those claims could be misplaced, but it is the function of reason to examine those claims, and reason, public reason, or to take account of them. Public reason should not be, a la Dawkins, uh, defined in ways that rule religion out. Right. Hello, thank you very much for your talk. Um, you seem to uh, want to argue for, well, not, not only not only physical realism, but also realism with respect to non-physical entities. That's the point. Um, and um, so, my question is: Well, first of all, what what argument? If and it seems that you're saying uh, that these arguments will can arguments for this can, cannot really come from empirical science itself, as Artigas seems to believe. So my question is, where would arguments for such a belief come from, rational arguments? And could this, uh, <clears throat> could, could this come from um, uh, uh, a dis discipline l like mathematics, where, uh, where eternal logical exact knowledge, which is non-empirical, appears. Yes, I, I mean, I think, first of all, I just must make it clear that by realism, I mean, I, I'm putting forward, to, to use a word that was mentioned this morning, I'm putting forward a neutral thesis because I actually th would think atheism is a realist view. It's about the non-existence of something as well as the existence of something. So I, by realism, I don't mean that these things must exist. I just mean that they could exist, and their existence is not dependent on our believing or understanding that they do. So, 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 that, so that's the first thing. You were asking about mathematics in particular. Um, I, I mean, I was thinking much more about... I mean, I'm never quite sure about the status of mathematics. I mean, I don't want to go to a full-blooded... Platonism. Uh, so, so, I mean, mathematical objects are, are rather curious. I mean, I'm thinking much more 
in terms of just the reality of the world as investigated by science, the reality alleged <coughs> of the world that religion tries to take account of. Uh, in other words, I'm talking about the objective reality of these, these different things. Now, what arguments have I got for that? I mean, I think just fundamentally, realism is an absolutely indispensable presupposition for the existence of thought and language. Take away realism, we can't teach language, we can't learn it, we can't think, because there's nothing to think about. Uh, so, I, I mean, I, I would put it as, as firmly as that. So, language, and this is a Platonic argument, actually. I mean, Plato himself uses it against Protagoras. Um, I do actually think that without uh, a, a notion of a reality we're about to which we all have independent access, uh, there is no sense in thinking that, in fact, uh, we're able to communicate or that we're able to talk to each other. Or... So, so, so that would be my starting point. But, and again, but it's an indis if I could just finish, for science, it's an indispensable presupposition for the conduct of science too. It's a regulative principle. Yeah, but it, it seems like a, f a physical reality would be enough for communication and uh, all sorts of other aspects of human life. But what rational reasons, apart from uh, mathematics, mathematical Platonism do we have for a non-empirical, non-physicalist reality? If well, I, I could put that th run the, the other way. I mean, I mean, why do you want to rule it out? I mean, in other words, the argument about whether we do or we don't believe in it is itself <coughs> a philosophical one. And, of course, um, and plenty of people, for instance, I mean, the starting point would be the reality of people's beliefs about this, reali this reality. It's very, very easy for small children to believe in the reality of God. It's surprising. I mean, not just because they're taught to. And uh, uh, they, uh, I mean, you can do all kinds of experiments, my colleagues do, do this, about showing how easy it is for, for children of about four to think in terms of the reality of God. It seems to be a way that comes right, in a way they've got to be weaned away from that rather than given it. So, so given that we start with that, um, why shouldn't we believe in that? Uh, there is, I mean, there are all kinds of beliefs. I mean, I suppose that the biggest argument actually for believing in the non the reality of the non-physical is one's own personal experience my consciousness of myself and i don't think my pain is physical i don't think i am physical i don't actually think i am identical with my body because i'm very conscious my body has changed very much but i feel i'm the same now that's again a starting point i mean you uh, Again, uh, in the, with the cognitive science uh, uh, experiments that go on, I mean, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that people are natural dualists. Now, that doesn't prove the truth of dualism, but it shows how easy it is to believe in dualism. That's the point. And I think most of us would, in a common sense way, believe that our minds and our bodies weren't quite the same thing. Robert Um, you implied that um, you didn't quite agree with Artigas's retro justification quite. idea. I was just wondering if you could expand on that. And, yeah. <coughs> well, I, I mean, I think it latches on to a, a kind of a, a big issue about the conduct of science and whether the conduct of science is itself, to some extent, its own validation. I think a lot of working scientists would say, yes, it is. I mean, this is, in a sense, why I mentioned William James, that it, it's the idea that it works. Um, it gives us a non-stick frying pan, so what, what, what are you grumbling about? Uh, I mean, it's, uh, it, you know, we can manipulate the world, we can put people on the moon, we can do all kinds of fantastic things. Uh, we couldn't do that unless there, there was some kind of tie-up with, with, with enabling us to manipulate reality. Isn't that all we need? Um, I, I, myself, I mean, I can understand that as a kind of uh, attitude, because it's, as I said, it's the impatience with metaphysics. Um, let's get on with it, let's not worry about these things. I, I myself don't feel it's, it's quite enough. I mean, I do really feel, well, pa perhaps all this is just luck or perhaps we're just able to do it here but it won't work everywhere. Uh, I mean, why should we assume that the same conditions hold across the universe? Why are we so sure physical laws are constant? Um, I mean, that the, the, you need a lot of justification for more. And the kind of justification that was built into Newton at the start so, so I think you need that. And I think that comes before you can do science. 
I think you've got to have some idea, implicit or explicit, about the reality of the world, its order, and its intelligibility, and the fact that we, we ourselves, can understand it. Why? And, and just doing it, um, well, I, I can understand the temptation of saying, well, that proves it, doesn't it? But, but I still think that you can get in a sceptical frame of mind and say, well, um, how do we know? And it, isn't, it seems to be more than just the scepticism that I might feel about saying, well, how do I know I'm looking out of the window, or how do I know I'm not a brain in a vat, or all that kind of thing. Um, I mean, it, it just seems to be, to, to, how do I know that science can generalise? I mean, it is the problem of induction, which, which Hume found so difficult. And what underpins our real belief that, that we can <coughs> extrapolate from comparatively few instances in a narrow series of places, to everywhere. Okay, can I then um, play devil's advocate and uh, yeah. throw back your, your remark a bit about, um, about immaterial realities? But actually, if it's your own personal experience that on a day to day basis you start with these assumptions and day by day, which is all you actually have to go on, day by day they're reinforced and reinforced and reinforced. If you put it on the same level as, 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 as you were commenting previously, I think it becomes quite compelling at least. I wouldn't argue that you can absolutely refute scepticism with it because you may not be able to do that ever. But I think you can understand how people become more and more compelled by it. Yes, uh, but, but you see, I don't think, I mean, the kind of things I was, I was saying before, I don't think they're knockdown arguments. I think that people are naturally dualists. They may even be natural theists, but it doesn't prove dualism, it doesn't prove theism. I think you, that just, that's the starting point, and uh, I mean, that's in a way where we start. So I, I think perhaps. It may be you could argue that, uh, that the, the onus is on the people who want to disprove it rather than prove it, but 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 it's still you haven't proved it, right. and uh, and I think uh, the, the trouble with science is uh, all right. I mean th this is a natural thing to think, it's the common sense way of thinking, but what happens when you're up against people who challenge it? Now I think this is all the clearer when people are challenging it. Now, uh, there are plenty of people under the postmodernist banner and other banners who actually challenge science. They, some of them just don't like modern science. They, I mean, for instance, they, they think that insofar as it's delivered the goods, they're not good. Uh, I mean, that it's responsible for all kinds of pretty terrible things, perhaps even ultimately the destruction of the planet. So, so they've got all kinds of motivations for not liking science, so they challenge it. Now, I think that one therefore needs to be able to say, well, whether science is, is in the end beneficial or not, it's telling us some things that are true about the world. And, uh, and I think one needs to justify why that is the case, rather than just bumbling on, saying, well, we do it because we do it, because it seems to work, etc. I, I still feel that's not enough. But I, I fully accept, I mean, I'm up against people who think that philosophy and metaphysics are an unutterable waste of time, and let's get on with the real world. Uh, <coughs> Steve Fuller, and then Kieran. Is it, um, yeah, sorry. Kieran Clark, yes. Uh, yes, and then yeah, we've got time. <laughs> we've got time for some family, sorry about that. <laughs> um, Roger, I was wondering uh, how this justification between realism and science works, because um, it's clear you want to use realism uh, to justify science, but then when you explicate realism and the arguments you give for it, especially the, the defense of theism, the defense of dualism, they sound to me like naturalistic arguments. You know, namely, kids are like that naturally, right? This is kind of the tenor of your arguments. We have these experiences that are irreducibly realist or dualist or something like that. And, uh, and someone might say, uh, well, you're using basically a scientific argument to justify realism, which is in turn going to be justifying science. Is that how it works? No, absolutely not. And I wasn't talking about the experience. I was talking about what the experience was allegedly of. So therefore, we appear to have beliefs in a non-material reality. It doesn't justify the existence of a non-material reality, but it does suggest that the discussion about it ought to be something we're concerned with. Um, but uh, certainly, uh, the fact that people naturally have beliefs and science can show us that um, doesn't justify or indeed fail to justify the beliefs. But that's just the opening, I and mean, it just shows why we need to have a philosophical argument. That's what I'm saying. Well, only one more point I would make. Uh, you didn't really give a lot of content to your realism other than making those sorts of remarks. Uh, well, I don't want to build in too much, you see. I mean, uh, again, I've, I've 
in a sense, would probably agree with the idea of a, a, a neutral oh, uh, metaphysics in the sense that uh, what I, I don't want to... I mean, one of the reasons I, say I don't like, for instance, so-called scientific realism is that it's not only talking about reality but saying it is as modern science or some science says it is. And I think that's not only making an ontological claim, it's bringing in an epistemological one. It's saying what there is and, and also what we know about it. Now, I want to keep discussion about what there is separate from epistemology. It justifies, grounds the epistemology, but there's still the question how much we know, how much we can know, and I think that the, the two ought really to, to be kept fairly separate. And that does mean, I, m I must confess, that my uh, ontology, my reality, does get rather thin, not thick. I mean, it's, uh, in a sense, um, talking about uh, reality as a target, a goal. It, it, it's a regulative principle. It isn't saying, um, from the point of view of philosophy, as a starting point, um, God, angels, ghost. I mean, I'm not filling in the, filling it all in. I'm just saying I'm not ruling those out. There's a possibility of all this. Let's have a discussion about what goes there. And, and if you say these things don't exist, these things can't exist, you're still standing outside science, and naturalism is itself as much a metaphysical position as anti-naturalism. That's all I'm saying. I'm afraid the, the last question mm -hmm. will have to be for Kieran, Kieran Clark. I'll be, very, I'll be very quick just to say that, uh, yeah, that naturalistic position, I, I suppose you can never, the, the, whole, the whole point is you can never prove reality. It's the first assumption that there, things are. Uh, and But uh, the, uh, I, I probably... Perhaps the way kids know does tell you something about maybe mm, some things that are non-natural and a little bit maybe forced. Uh, I'm thinking about, for example, the way that uh, we've recently discovered that, that young children learn the, 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 the difference between na naturally no biological movement as distinct from non-biological movement, you know, from the age of from the first weeks of life. Uh, it just maybe puts the onus on people who have a univocal notion of materiality to explain uh, how that can be, whereas previously, perhaps, pe people who thought, well, you know, th there is a ghost somewhere that, that will have to be explained if you, if for people who believe in God, even without even bringing God into it now. We, there, there needs to be some sort of an, uh, an explanation how these two things can be different for people to to know them. Yes, I mean, your, your reference to children is interesting as, as well, I think, because uh, it, it, it's certainly the case that you find that little children, uh, for instance, I mean, see purpose in things. I mean, when you're saying that the, even very small infants uh, can separate out the, the, the kind of biological, non-biological, and obviously there are the good reasons why they would be able to do that, and they can see intentional from non-intentional, and they tend to see purpose, and even purpose, it's more natural to see things as uh, the result of purpose, even when it's not. Um, indeed, a lot of um, that kind of research, I think, is tending to show that we are natural creationists rather than natural evolutionists, too, which, I mean, doesn't sh prove a lot, but it shows why it is that it's so difficult to latch on to evolution, and so easy it, is it to believe in, in a kind of very rudimentary creationism. Um, because that's what our starting point, and you might even actually say from a, <coughs> a, a more um, kind of scientific point of view, there are good evolutionary reasons why we shouldn't believe in evolution, we should just see purpose. <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, because, of course, I mean, you've got to actually pick out the, 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 the animals and the other th creatures that could be a threat. I mean, people who don't recognise that lions are going to eat you are going to get eaten. Uh, so, so all of that comes into it as, as well, I think, yes.